Okay, good morning. Now we are going to discuss on uh, elucidation of biosynthetic pathway by isotope labeling and uh, retrobiosynthetic uh, NMR analysis. And uh, if you remember in the previous uh, chapters, we have discussed about a comprehensive, a comprehensive uh, overview of the various uh, biosynthetic pathways. In uh, chapter two, we discussed about the acetate pathway where acetyl coenzyme A is the building block leading to fatty acid, prostaglandins, naphthaquinones, anthraquinones. And we also discussed in chapter three about the shikimate pathway where the shikimate is used as a building block leading to cumarins, lignans, various classes of uh, flavonoids. And uh, we also discussed about the mevalonate pathway where the uh, dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate or isopentyl pyrophosphate used as a building block leading to different classes of, of, of terpenoids. We also discussed about the amino acids where amino acids are also used as uh, starting materials or building blocks leading to different classes of, of, of alkaloids. Not only this, we also discussed about the alkaloids, the non-amino acid pathway, as well as the mixed biosynthesis pathway. We also discussed on the application of, 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 of uh, the secondary metabolites in chemical ecology. Now, the next discussion will be on how the biosynthetic pathway has been uh, uh, exhaustively studied experimentally using the isotope labeling and retrobiosynthetic NMR analysis techniques. So there are uh, two important terms I would like to, to briefly explain before proceeding to, to the details of, of, of this session. The first one is what do we mean by isotope labeling? And the second one is what do we mean by retrobiosynthetic analysis? Now, isotope labeling is a technique that is used to, to track the passage of an isotope through a reaction or a metabolic pathway. And the reactant is labeled by replacing specific atoms by their isotope. For example, in the case of uh, hydrogen, we replace it by deuterium. And then allowed to undergo a certain reaction. So the position of the isotope in the product will be analyzed and the sequence of as a sequence will be followed in the reaction or in the metabolic pathway. And usually, in, the, in, in those days, radio uh, radionucleotides were, were being used as, 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 uh, for in, 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 in isotope labeling. But uh, due to the health impact over the years, scientists tilted toward the stable nuclei, nucleides. And uh, now I, uh, the, most of the discussions that I'm going to focus in, in the consecutive sessions will be how these stable nucleides are used in isotope labeling as well as retrobiosynthetic analysis. Where in the case of uh, radionuclides, the, mostly this is also uh, known as radio labeling experiments. And um, the term retrobiosynthetic analysis is in fact a conventional approach to study probable biosynthetic precursors, enzymatic steps, and even intermediate metabolites. So what are the precursors of that the desired target molecule? How enzymatic transformations proceeded? What enzymes, what coenzymes participated? How does the secondary modification steps, cyclization, condensation, and reduction, ox oxidation? We will have an overview of understanding of these enzymatic transformations and the possible uh, biosynthetic precursors as well as intermediate involved in the biosynthetic route. So this position specific isotope distribution within the molecule will help us to rationally interpret the biochemical process that might be involved in the biosynthetic pathway. So now connecting these two principles, now 
in our consecutive discussions, we will discuss how these isotope labeling techniques are applied to deduce the biochemical or the biosynthetic processes involved in certain pl plants. And then what is also the application of NMR in this retrobiosynthetic analysis, okay? Now the use of isotopically labeled organic compounds as tracers for elucidation of metabolic pathways in organisms as well as tissues or even cells is in fact an old phenomena. It's a time honored concept. And the earliest tracer studies were conducted with Dutreb in nine, back in 1930s. Now, labeling experiments using the deuterium isotopes were introduced back in 1930s when heavy water uh, was available by that time. Until 1960s, isotope use in the biochemistry was then mostly dominated by radioisotopes. But later, a variety of factors have been, have been appeared and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the scholars or scientists have shifted to the use of stable isotopes. And this is due to uh, the fact that these stable isotopes involve no health hazards, and in fact, they are exempt from safety regulations. And uh, in fact, with the, progress, with the progress of NMR and the mass spectrometry instrumentation techniques, which has greatly in enhanced the sensitivity of stable isotope detection. So now more researchers have been engaged in elucidating the biosynthetic pathways with the help of NMR and mass spec instrumentation. Now, the, the concept is a single carbon source from the, from the can be used as a starting material, in most cases labeled carbon dioxide. And then the process, the biochemical transformations in this isotopically labeled carbon dioxide will be followed with the help of NMR spectroscopic analysis. And that will be our point of, point of discussion for today. So can we really be able to elucidate the biochemical transformations or the pathway with the help of NMR? Are there studies published before? This will be our point of discussion. Now, so what I'm saying is when the precursor will be isotopically labeled and then we follow the conversion of that isotopically labeled carbon, or a proton, its position across the process. And we also see its position in the product with the help of, of spectroscopic techniques. So in essence, what I'm saying is we will analyze the precursor product relationship with the help of this spectroscopic technique. Now, plants make adjustments for maximum utilization of the incoming light from photosynthesis. And from our previous discussions, we know that carbon dioxide plus water through photosynthesis give glucose. And glucose through glycolysis pathway goes to pyruvate. And we know that the carboxylation of pyruvate goes to acetyl coenzyme A. Now, it is this acetyl coenzyme A that is converted into either malonyl coenzyme A and then being used as a starter unit where malonyl coenzyme A used as a, 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 an extender unit, then the acetate pathway starts or the acetyl coenzyme is converted into mevalonic acid, then mevalonic acid is converted into dimethyl allyl phyrophosphate and isopentyl phyrophosphate, then the mevalonic pathway starts. Or the acetyl coenzyme A through Krebs cycle converted into amino acids, and then some of these amino acids, I mean, we, we discussed around nine different subclasses of amino acids being converted into different classes of alkaloids. Now, when a labeled carbon dioxide is being used as a carbon source, this is the bottom line. When a labeled carbon dioxide is being used as a carbon source, 
then photosynthesis will generate a labeled carbohydrate. Okay? Now, generally, the detection and quantification of this labeled carbon across the biochemical process will be examined with the help of NMR spectroscopic technique. Now, we know that in carbon NMR spectra, where the carbon 30 has a natural abundance of 1.1%, usually, unless it is carbon of decoupled NMR, the carbon spectra appears as a single A. Okay? Now, this is a bottom line. When two or more carbon atoms are connected by either one to four covalent bonds, okay? Now the signals will split now into multiplets. So we, the, the, this implies that now the spectrum is becoming complex. These carbon-carbon coupling constants are a very important criteria to see the sequence if the carbon-carbon coupling constants are re related to directly connected carbon atoms. They appear, this coupling constant appear usually between 30 to 70. Whereas if the connectivity is above two or four bonds, so the, 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 now the coupling constant will lower up to 10 hertz. So this splitting pattern, due to the carbon-carbon coupling and the coupling constant linked to this splitting pattern will help us to know the position of that isotopically labeled carbon. In a sense, what I am saying is, if we know the position of those labeled carbons, then we can easily track the biochemical or the biosynthetic transformations. That help us to know the biosynthetic route, okay? Now, for example, we know that acetyl coenzyme A has two carbons. Suppose both these two carbons are labeled. Now, if we consider a molecule of acid in which both these carbons are labeled, then we will have labeled as acetyl coenzyme A. Now, both of these carbon contain half a spin, so they couple each other. This carbon-carbon coupling now shows a splitting, where depending on whether it is a one bond, or a two bond, or a three bond, or a four bond coupling, then the J value differs the value of that J value tells us the connectivity as well as the position of those isotopically labeled carbons. Let's see a retrobiosynthetic st study that have been carried out to determine the biosynthesis of polyacetylenes such as panax panaxinol and epoxypanaxinol in ginseng plant. Okay? Now, these are the structures of polyacetylenes, one and two. So these scholars use isotopically labeled carbon dioxide, where the plant has been exposed to this labeled carbon dioxide under field conditions, and the plant has been exposed for close to 10 hours and then allowed to grow for 19 days under natural conditions. So the plant has been already fed with the labeled carbon dioxide. So the normal biosynthetic primary metabolism conversion of those labeled carbon dioxide to labeled glucose now started. Now, after 90 days, they extracted the plant and they got mixture of compounds. So, and using a routine purification protocol that we know, they isolated two compounds, panaxinol and panaxinol epoxide. Okay, 
this is how the portable unit is used in a controlled incubation where the plant has been exposed with a leveled carbon dioxide under field conditions for 9.5 hours and then the plant was allowed to 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 grow for 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 19 days okay now so the plant used this labeled carbon dioxide to synthesize a labeled glucose and then this labeled glucose was converted into labeled pyruvate so the carboxylation of the labeled carb pyruvate now gave a labeled acetyl coenzyme a and this biosynthetic transformation proceeded for compounds one and two where one is panaxinol and two is panaxinol epoxide now the question is how do these scholars be able to to determine the splitting pattern as well as the biosynthetic route with the help of of of, of nmr now look now the carbons have been labeled from 1 to 70 where the corresponding or the respective j carbon carbon coupling constant values have been seen in the left Now, so the, after examining the coupling constant values, okay, which in most cases appear between 30 to 70, and as you know, as I mentioned earlier, the direct carbon-carbon coupling constants show a value between 30 to 70. So because of the fact that both carbons, one and two of the acetyl coenzyme A, are labeled so this carbon carbon splitting showed a coupling constant within the expected range okay this is the spectrum how it looks like and you see a coupling between carbon one and two ten and nine and four and three and like like that so which means now this and these carbons coupled splitted and likewise, this and this, this and this, this and this, this and this. So because of the fact that both carbons are labeled, okay? So the coupling splitting pattern appear for the direct connectivity between 30 to 70, okay? So this shows that, okay? This is a very good confirmation that panaxinol epoxide and panaxinol are biosynthesized through acetate pathway, confirming that they follow this polyketide pathway, okay? And this has been confirmed by NMR analysis, okay? Likewise, the NMR retrobiosynthetic labeling experiment was also used to deduce a biosynthetic path of sorginolo and this is uh, the quinone and which is the aliphatic component of sorghum and uh, with a similar phenomena they used uh, one two labeled acetates no two labeled acetates not both of them but only they labeled the second carbon of the acetate moiety and then the plant has been fed with this labeled carbon dioxide. So this labeled carbon dioxide through sort of photosynthesis converted into labeled glucose, and then the biosynthesis has started. Now, the last spectrum, spectrum E, shows splitting between carbon two, four, six, okay? Why? is a question now as i mentioned earlier it is the second carbon of the acetate moiety that is labeled 
And then we know that acetyl coenzyme A in the presence of biotin cofactor and ATP, it is converted into malonyl coenzyme A where malonyl coenzyme A is used as extender unit and acetyl coenzyme A is used as, as a starter unit. So with a, a normal six step biosynthetic path leading to fatty acid, now the palmonyl intermediate has been biosynthesized. Now because of the fact that, please underline this, because of the fact that it is only the second carbon of the acetyl coenzyme A that is labeled, okay? Now you see the isotope labeled carbons on alternating carbons, not on a direct connectivity, okay? This suggests that because one of them is labeled, now you see the labeled one on alternating carbons, not on direct, directly connected carbons, okay? Now, this implies that now carbons two, four, and six are labeled, but not one, three, five, and you only see splitting for two, four and six because now the coupling is two bond away the j value will be lower than 30 but you still see the splitting because of the carbon 13 13 splitting so two will couple with four four will couple with six and you see splitting okay carbon carbon splitting with with their respective j values this suggests that even though one of the carbons of acetyl coenzyme A is labeled. Through that biosynthetic conversions. Now this labeled carbon is included in the sorted olon skeleton. And we see splitting pattern of the alternating carbons, such as for example, in this specific case, where two, four, six carbons show splitting. And this is a very good experiment also showing that the isotopic labeling experiment that has been done on Sordilon confirmed that the compound is biosynthesized through acetate pathway, okay? Now, in the previous case, both of the one and two carbons were labeled, and then the, the plant has been, no, the, 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 the labeled, the plant has been fed, fed with, with this labeled intermediate or starting material, and then the biosynthetic pathway proceeded. So we see a direct splitting between two adjacent carbons. That is why we see a higher J value, okay, above 30. That was what they used in the case of panoxyl epoxide in the plant ginseng, okay. But in this specific case, in the case of sorghum, where they used the second carbon labeled acetate, you need to deduce the biosynthetic conversion of sardulone in a plant sorghum. Though so only one of the carbon is labeled, yet we still see the labeled carbons on alternating carbons. So we see still splitting, but with a lower J value because the couplings are two bond away. So again, this is a very good example showing that the sorgilone quinone is an acetate derived secondary metabolite okay with a similar phenomena retro biosynthetic labeling experiment was also used to deduce the biosynthetic pathway leading to genocide okay genocide G this is also the these are the compounds that has also been uh, uh, reported from, from, from uh, ginseng. Now, in this experiment also, they used uh, a second carbon labeled acetate. And uh, now we know that the acetyl coenzyme A is converted into mevalonic acid. And this mevalonate is now 
converting into dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate or isopentyl pyrophosphate, where both of them are C5 units. And these C5 units now in head to tail manner form geranyl pyrophosphate. Now, addition of one IPP to the geranyl pyrophosphate leads to farnesyl pyrophosphate, where again, addition of one IPP to farnesyl pyrophosphate will lead to geranyl geranyl pyrophosphate. Now, geranyl pyrophosphate is a starting material for monoterpenes, whereas farnesyl pyrophosphate is a starting material leading to sesquiterpenes, whereas the geranyl geranyl pyrophosphate is a starting material leading to diterpenes. Now, in the case of triterpenes, it's different. Now, this is a specific example in the case of, for example, the ginsinoside, which is a triterpene. Now, the biosynthetic pathway of triterpenes is different, where to farnesyl pyrophosphate constituting 15 carbon units, in a head to tail manner, they merge to form a squalene, where a squalene is a starting intermediate leading to triterpenes. Further, the squalene is converted into a squalene epoxide or squalene oxide before cyclization commences. Then, consecutive cyclization to different subclasses of triterpene constitute where we may have A, B, C, D, D rings of, 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 of triterpenes, okay? Now, in this specific case, they used a second carbon-labeled acetate unit. So this shows that this carbon, which is indicated by asterisk, is now the labeled one. Now, follow the path, okay? Follow the path. Now, if you follow the path, this labeled carbons are strictly indicated in asterisk in squalene, okay? And this is the correct path where squalene oxide has been cyclized first into prost prost prosteryl cation, where prosteryl cation in, in, in consecutive steps is converted into genocides, okay? Now, from, from, from this path, it is also clearly seen that the correct position of the, the labeled carbon has been clearly indicated in squalene and consecutively they have been clearly seen, seen in, 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 in the target product as well. So this shows that because of the fact that now the labeled carbons are also seen and identified by NMR technique in, 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 the, in the genocides, then that shows that it is also a mevalonate-driven triterpene. And this has been also deduced by, retro, by uh, the erythrobiosynthetic techniques, okay? And with a similar phenomena, the carbon-13 has been also applied to deduce a biosynthetic route leading to lupiol, a triterpene, and um, also they used the second carbon labeled acetate unit and they followed the, the splitting pattern uh, of, 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 of the carbon NMR uh, spectrum, okay? And not only the, the path, but also the cyclizations, the secondary modifications, the intermediates, all these can be easily um, uh, explained with this retro biosynthetic path, okay? So in the case of this lupule, as I mentioned earlier, they used again uh, the labeled, uh, the second carbon labeled acetate unit. So you have a labeled dimethyl aliphyrophosphate or azopentyl phyrophosphate. And as I mentioned earlier, now this uh, labeled one split and based on the range of J values, the exact position of the labeled carbons can be determined, suggesting a plausible biosynthetic path, possible interconvergence, possible intermediates, and a possible path has, you know, has also been deduced for, for lupiol, okay? So, also the application of Isotope labeling and retro biosynthetic analysis is a recent phenomenon. And uh, still several scholars are still studying the, the biosynthetic path leading to different secondary metabolites 
interesting intermediate complex structures, this retrobiosynthetic analysis coupled with the application of mass spec or, or NMR analysis with the help of isotopically labeled atoms helped to track the passage of the isotopes through a metabolic pathway and the labeled reactant will be followed. What type of conversions does it undergo? And it will be analyzed with, with the help of the spectral pathway, okay? Now, as I mentioned earlier, the possible biosynthetic precursors, enzymatic conversions, intermediates, and can be, can be determined with, by examining the specific position of, 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 of the isotope involved in the biosynthetic, con biosynthetic conversion. So the very important concept here that I would like to underline is carbon has an abundance, carbon-13 has a, an abundance of 1.1%, okay? And it appears to be a singlet unless it is carbon of resonance decoupled spectrum, okay? Now, when two or more carbon atoms are connected, okay, now these signals split because both of them have a spin of half and they coupled to each other. Now it is, it is becoming multiplated and rather now the spectrum is, is, is complex. And this carbon-carbon coupling constants, especially the value, shows whether they are directly connected, if the J value is within a range of 70, or if the J value is less than 10, then that shows the carbon is two or four bond away. So with the help of labeled carbon dioxide, or labeled acetate units, either labeling both carbon one and two or labeling one of them. Then we track these isotopes and elucidate the structure with the help of NMR, see the multi multi multiplicity pattern, see the J value, and this will tell us now the possible biochemical interconversions, possible starting materials, intermediates, and what happened O over the course of the enzymatic transformations. So that is how the biosynthetic pathways has been determined experimentally. I would like to underline this experimentally with the help of NMR and mass spec techniques. With this, I'm, I'm winding up the, the discussion. Thank you very much.